car wash yesterday, and they did wonderfully. They they stuck it out. It was it was hot out. It was 90 degrees, and the sun was blasting, and a bunch of them got toasty critters. But they they pushed through all the way to the end. They had a a good take. I think they were over $500 worth of car wash, and that's awesome. If you did not, that's really awesome. Um, if you did not have a chance to have your car washed yesterday by our beloved youth, then uh, you might consider giving them a little love offering for all the sun that they put up with to serve the community. So it was a, it was a super awesome time. I stopped by over there, and they had a line of cars, and they were getting it. I mean, they were, they were washing and everything. My, my son struggles to work, and they had him working. I do not know. Kay, Kay and I have sat our kids down on multiple occasions and said, you know what, we both had full-time jobs when we were 15. Y'all need it. Amen. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but we're getting there in Jesus' name. They're going to be, they're going to have, they're going to have our, our work ethic if it kills both of us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So take that generation X or whatever you are, millennials. All right, so... If you're out there, we really love you, millennials. You're welcome to come to Beloved Church. We'll fix you. <laughs> Amen. Please go with me to Psalms chapter 138. Psalms 138. Starting in verse 1, the psalmist, who in this case is David, says, I will praise thee for my, with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I think it's interesting that David recognized that there were other things on this earth that tried to be gods that are no gods. And David said he's going to stand right in the face of all those things that think that they're gods. And he says, I'm going to praise the God. Amen. I think that's awesome. I think all these things that try to God over your life and try to Lord over your life, I think every once in a while, you should just get right up in their face and say, I got news for you, buddy. There is one God. His name is Jesus Christ, and he is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and he rules the universe easily. So you just back it on up, cowboy. Amen. I think you should do that. That's, a, that's an order from your pastor. Verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. This is really important. I'm going to praise you, God, the real God, the real Lord. I'm going to praise you for your loving kindness and for your truth. First of all, I want to point out there's a difference between the two. You know, a lot of people like to have an experience with God's love. And it kind of ends there. They basically have a relationship with God that's emotional. And that is not sufficient to have a successful Christian life. It's important for having a successful Christian life. It's important to experience God and to experience His love and to have an encounter with Him that touches the deepest places of who you are. And even affects your emotions, affects your thinking. You know, there are times for tears. There are times for joy. There's times for dancing and jumping. There's times for being prostrate on your face and crying out unto the Lord. There's, to there's important times for that. But that is not the whole, that is not the entirety of the Christian life. There is also a time to praise Him for His truth. Just like Pastor Dennis got up and said, you know, there is a hypocrisy for you to just spew out the belief that the world wants to put in you. For you to agree with the world is for you to be hypocritical of what God has said. If the world says that you're sick and you say, I'm sick, you're actually being a hypocrite. Because God has said, and remember, is God above God's. God has said, you are healed by the stripes of my son. But I don't feel like it. Okay, so now we're moving from praising God for loving kindness. Now we're moving into praising God for truth. I praise you for the truth. I don't feel like the truth. I don't see the truth. I look in my checkbook. I don't see the truth. I'm not experiencing the truth in this emotion. I'm not experiencing the truth in this physical part of my body. But I'm praising you for the truth because the truth is the truth. Amen. 
If the truth just all the time was always true, then there would be no such thing as court systems. There would be no such thing as police officers. There would be no such thing as right and wrong. There'd be, because the truth would just always be the truth. But the reason that there is all of these things, all of these different layers in our society and in our lives is because sometimes people don't want to live from and operate from the truth. You have to participate with the truth. Another interesting thing here is this word loving kindness in the Hebrew is the word hasid or kasid. And it's the Hebrew word that is, in my opinion, and this is my estimation, this is of Steveism. If you don't like it, that's fine. You can write me a letter. I've had it happen before. And I'm to, I believe that this word is the closest word that we have to charis in the Greek, which is the word for the grace of God. And my definition of the grace, one of my definitions of the grace of God is the uncreated deifying power of God. The uncreated deifying power of God. Which means that it's a power that's not created. So it comes from the one that was not created. God was not created. And his power is uncreated power. It's power that just exists in who he is. And his grace flows into your life, not because of you, but because of him. That is so important. We are building the house of grace here at Beloved. And it's, it is a hard road to hoe. I can promise you. I mean, look around. There's not a lot of workers. Amen. Not everybody wants to build the house of grace. But you do. God bless you. God bless you. This is a big deal. We're building a house of grace. This message of grace in today's world is not well receptive. Because a lot of people want to chastise us, want to rebuke us, because they think that the grace message takes away from personal responsibility. And here's the reality. If you hear the grace message, it will add to you responsibility to respond if you understand how great, how powerful the grace of God is. It doesn't take away responsibility. It takes away shame. It takes away guilt. It takes away condemnation. And the world thinks that unless you have shame, guilt, and condemnation, you're just not living for God. I'm here to tell you, if you have shame, guilt, and condemnation, you're not living for God. Because God's grace will take those things away. Because Jesus bore them at the cross. And so I am going to adamantly, I am going to, without reservation, proclaim the grace of God that has been displayed for us at the finished work of the cross because none of you are going to go to the cross and earn anything more than what Jesus Christ has already gone to the cross and earned for you and then has turned around in the resurrection and given it to you freely by His grace. And we're going to proclaim this message. I don't care if I got to tear the walls down, if I got to tear the roof off, and I got to put speakers up there. We are going to get the grace of God, the message of the grace of God, into people's lives, into people's marriages, into people's health, into people's attitudes, into people's everything, if it kills me. And it might. And I'm willing to be a martyr for this message because Jesus was a martyr for this message. Amen. This loving kindness, this hasid of God that's on display in this verse, this is something that changed David's life. You know, David's life was changed by the grace and the mercy of God. It wasn't the law of God that changed David. It was the grace and the mercy of God that changed David. Did David make mistakes? Oh, my Lord. We're not even going to go there. But here's what I'll tell you. In the New Testament, when the New Testament talks about David, it doesn't talk about his mistakes. I want you to think about that. When the New Testament talks about Moses, it doesn't talk about his mistakes. When the New Testament talks about Rahab, it mentions her in the lineage of Jesus Christ, the harlot. See, in the New Testament, it filters through the blood and the finished work of the cross. When you look at yourself in the New Testament, in the finished work of the cross, all those things, all those failures in your past don't filter through. They have to stay on the other side of the cross because that's where death is. There's life past the cross. There's death at the cross. You need to come to the cross and die. I'm okay with that. But if you stay there and stay dead, then you did not have what Jesus Christ came to give you because what he came to give you was abundant life. Amen? So guilt and condemnation cannot stay. This loving kindness of God, this hasid of God is what changed David 
from a shepherd to a, a worshiping king to a ruler and a reigner in life. And in uh, Romans chapter five, uh, chapter 5, verse 20, 20 or 21, look it up, it's a great chapter. Um, it talks about that we have an opportunity to rule and to reign because of the grace of God that has been given us through Jesus Christ. We can reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not reigning in life, that means that there's an opportunity for you to experience more. You should be reigning. And most of us feel like we're being reigned on. <laughs> Amen. You're not Linus with a little dark cloud following you around. We are the chosen ones of God. We are the royal priesthood, the chosen generation. We are the ones that God has chosen to rule this planet, to occupy until I come. Just like Brittany quoted from uh, Matthew chapter 16, we are supposed to be going into all the world and making disciples of nations. Nations. Nations are supposed to be being discipled, disciplined by our gospel. Amen. David was praising him for his loving kindness, for his grace, for his hasid, and for the truth. So you just having an experience with God is not enough. There has to be truth entwined with that. There are a lot of people that I know that have had experiences with God, and they are as loopy as a chain. Crazy. They have gone out there, and they have lost it because they've made it all about some kind of a physical thing, some kind of an experience. They need to have some kind of an emotion, some kind of a rush some kind of a goosebump. Some kind, that is not the entirety of the kingdom of God. Should you have that? Yes. <laughs> this might be a little PG, but I want you to get this. Kay and I have intimacy. She loves it when I talk about this stuff. She loves it. <laughs> she tells me every time I talk about it how much she loves it. That's a profession of my faith. Kay and I have intimacy. But if our entire marriage was about intimacy, you realize we would be absolutely devastated as it comes to life and success in our destiny. You need to have intimacy in that way with Jesus. You need to have that experience. You need to have that time where it's just, it's wrecking you from top to bottom and making everything come undone on the inside of you. But that is not the goal. You know, Jesus was not having a rush of emotions when he was hanging on the cross and dying. And never has the power of God's grace, love, and goodness been on greater display than at that moment on the cross when his body was literally being excruciatingly tortured. Never has the power of God been in greater display. Stop boiling God down to your experience. And stop trying to hold God accountable for you having an experience one way or another. If you have an experience, praise God. It came natural. If I told Kay, you know what, it's 10 o'clock and it's Tuesday, get up. Would that be intimacy? Absolutely not. Not in any way. Not in any way. And so if I came to church on Sunday morning, okay, God, Dennis is done. We're song number two. You better hit me. Right? Come on now. If you just through the course of intimacy and through the course of relationship, if you're going there, man, you're just like, wow, God, wow. That's natural. That's real. And that's going to stay with you. Amen? David was talking about this, that beautiful mix between Hasid, that powerful grace of God, and truth mixing together. Jesus said it this way, those who worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. You miss one of those two, you're not actually worshiping him. God, I praise you that you're the one that made me sick and taught me all those lessons. Yeah, that's not worship. You just blasphemed God. He, he's not receiving that. Oh, well, what a good kid. Thanks for praising me for something that the devil did. <laughs> okay, that went over real well. So anyway, Psalms chapter 138, verse 2 says, For I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. What's really powerful about this verse is he's praising him for his name. 
Now I'll remind you in the Greek and the Hebrew, name isn't like you say Bob and your head turns. Name is talking about character and nature. He's praising him for his character and his nature. His character and his nature is loving kindness and truth. So David is praising, through the Holy Spirit, David is praising God for his character and his nature, which is the grace, the loving kindness of God, and the truth of God. And then he comes in with the second part of this verse, and he says, but you have magnified your word even above your name. Do you know how radical that is? Do you know how radical that is? That'd be like somebody coming up to you and say, you know, I think God is awesome. God is worthy to be praised. God is, God is a, a, a love and God is good. And I'd say, you know what I really love? His word. You know, you just offended that person that came up to you and talked about how great God was. You know why God did this? I want you to think about this. Why would God make this statement? Because the person that has the experience with God's nature is always going to be kind of held a little bit hostage to experiences, but the person that gets it through God's word has God's word available to them for the rest of their life and on into eternity. God magnifies his word even above his name. Now what's even more radical about this is Philippians chapter 3 says, Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, let this mind be in you. Let this way of thinking, let this kind of logic be a part of your life. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be called equal with God, but made himself obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, that at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father. That's the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess at the name of Jesus. And this verse says that God has exalted his word even above his name. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. If every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess at just the name of Jesus and his word is magnified above his name, oh my Lord. We do not realize how much power is right here. Right here. Right here. Collecting dust on many of our bookshelves. The power to change the universe is right here solidified by Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not taken away from Jesus Christ because here's the truth. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When you say Jesus, really what you're saying is Word. Jesus is not a name, beloved. Jesus is who he is. His, his name's not Jesus like my name's Steve. Jesus is talking about Yeshua from the Old Testament. Joshua, Yeshua, which literally means deliverer. Deliverer. And when you say Jesus Christ, you're actually saying, the, you're actually saying deliverer, the Christ. Which means deliverer, the anointed one of God. So you're not just saying deliverer like I delivered you from prison. Way to go, Steve. He's awesome. You're actually saying the one from God who's anointed by God, the only one that's ever been anointed in that way by God, who is a deliverer for my life. When you're saying Jesus Christ, you're saying a mouthful. Here's what you're actually saying. You're actually saying the word when you say Jesus Christ. John chapter, 14, or John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And that word became flesh and walked among us the word became flesh and walked among us this word has hands has feet and it wants to walk around in the midst of your life and if you allow this word to walk around in the midst of your life and the midst of your heart you will find that the word is magnified even above your experiences with god and it will change everything so let me say this, I dutifully, dutifully encourage you to have a great and intense honor and value for the word of God, because in here, anything you need is available. Any seed that you need to plant in your heart is right here, right here. 
And the sad part is, if I walked up to you and I asked you, what do you believe in God for? I am believing God for, for uh, more money. What verse are you standing on? Well, you know, it says in there somewhere about having more money. I'm going to get there. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 is probably only over a few pages if you've got a cool little Bible like mine. Which Brittany was struggling with. I thought that was cute. Amen. Not everybody can work one of these. Only us professionals. <laughs> my son. Uh, so, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son. First of all, I want to point this out. This is language to the family of God. My son. My son. My daughter. This is to sons and daughters. Is that anybody in here? Anybody a son or a daughter? All right, for the rest of you, if you stay later, we're going to pray for salvations. You can get born again, and you can be a son or a daughter. Amen. This is written to sons and daughters. Now, here's the reason I'm saying that, because you're not going to get some of these things from logic. You have to always have intimacy and relationship as a part of how the Word gets into your heart. If you just kind of take these things from, from a logical standpoint, there are things in here that are beneficial. There are people incredibly successful people, you know, John Maxwell and Zig Ziglar that have taken a lot of these principles and they put them into applicationable processes into our natural lives. And I'm all for that. I'm, I'm cool with that because either way, the word of God's getting into you. But I'm telling you, the applications and the power that's available for you to have this experience through intimacy changes everything. Changes everything. This is, says, my son. Let me say this. My son, my daughter. And I'm, from here on out, I'm checking out of Steve Castle, and I'm checking into the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking as of the oracles of God. I'm believing God that every word that comes out of my lips are anointed, and they're for you and for your circumstances. And so my son and my daughter, listen, forget not, forget not my law. Vine's Expository Dictionary says that the definition of law here is direction, direction or education don't forget my direction and my education why would the holy spirit say that because you can you can forget what you've been taught you know how you forget what you've been taught one is you don't rehearse it and two is life circumstances come along and tell you that what you've been taught was wrong amen because the devil will come and say by his stripes you're healed nothing you're sick. Don't you feel it? Can't you feel it? See, by your stripes I'm healed doesn't work for you because you're sick. Forget not. Forget not. Who's the understood subject of this sentence? If you were to break this down based upon English laws and in writing and, and grammar, if you were to break this down grammatically, there's an understood subject. The understood subject is you. You forget not. You know, it's okay to, to blame God. He's got big, broad shoulders. You know what? You can blame him all day long. But here's what I'll tell you. The more you blame him, the less you'll have in your life. Your cooperation with him and with the truth is what's going to bring powerful benefits into your life. And so you can blame God that you forgot something or you're not operating in something. But the reality is, as the word says, you forget not. You forget not his law. You forget not his teaching. You forget not his education, his instruction. You forget not. How do you not forget? Well, you keep reminding yourself of it. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, some of you forget that you've been forgiven. You do. Because God, condemnation comes in and says, well, are you sure you're forgiven? You feel really sucky right now, don't you? I'm sorry. Kay hates it when I say that. You feel really bad right now. So therefore, you can't be forgiven because your feelings are telling you that you don't feel forgiven. So you can't be forgiven. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not any of his benefits who forgives all your sins and who heals all your iniquities. Does anybody know what all means in Hebrew? Wow. So he heals all your diseases. Well, you know, I mean, all the diseases from, you know, way back when and they wrote that. You know what? You can twist this up any way you want to. But God's word is eternal. And if he forgives all your diseases and he wrote that to you, then all of your diseases have been healed. All of your sins have been forgiven. But you don't know what I did. You know what? You're right. And I don't want to know, so don't tell me. But God knows because he was there. And he still forgave you. 
You need to remember that. You need to remember that. And let your lifestyle reflect a person who's been forgiven. Amen? Forget not. Don't forget his direction and his education. Forget not my law, but let thine heart. Who let? You let. Who let? You let. You let your heart keep his commandments. You know, you cannot keep the commandments of God from your effort. You can't even keep them from your, your great self-control. From all of your, um, the self-help that is very prevalent in today's world. You can't self-help yourself into a place of keeping the goodness of God. Because it can only come from your heart. The fruit of the Spirit are born in your heart. And one of the parts of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. You do not have the ability to control self. But the fruit of the Spirit that comes from your heart has the ability to give you the strength to control self. You know why you failed at controlling self? Because you've been trying to control self through your strength. <laughs> your strength, your righteousness is as filthy rags. But the righteousness of God is pure. It's, per it's perfect. The righteousness of God can control self. You can only do this from the heart. See, even the grace of God was available in the Old Testament, but it was grace concealed instead of being grace revealed like you and I have. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians, it says, um, forsake sin. Awake unto righteousness and sin not. Awake unto righteousness. The more you're awakened to righteousness, the less failure and mistake, the less you'll miss the mark. That's what sin is, missing the mark. The less you'll miss the mark, the more you become aware and awake unto righteousness. That's a powerful truth. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. Now, I'm, I'm not going to have time to break this down, but let me say this. There's a difference between length of days and long life. Either that or God likes to just be redundant and say the same thing back to back. It's not what God's doing. He's actually, these are two different things that he's saying here. Length of days and long life. These are two different things. It looks the same because we've over-spiritualized the Bible and we think, well, this is talking about eternity. We just get to live with God in eternity. Um, you know, Jesus is not super concerned about your eternity because if he can get abundant life into you now, if he can get the eternal life into you now, eternity is dealt with. He's trying to get these things now. Jesus is the God that is I am. Not the I will be. Not the I was. Jesus says, I am. He gets eternal life into you in the M, in the present, and it affects everything. He's not super concerned about getting you into heaven. He's more concerned about getting heaven into you. Amen. If I'd preach on that, we're going to be here for weeks. And so I'm just going to move on. Length of days and long life. Length of days, long life. Have you ever had a day when you got to the end of the day and you feel like, man, I just don't feel like I got anything accomplished today? You know what your day was? Short. Man, I just don't, I feel like I, I'm just not making any progress. I just feel like I'm spinning my wheels. I just feel like, you know, I spend all day long doing whatever, and it's just some kind of a cycle. It, you know what that is? That's short days. You know what you have in the kingdom of God when you allow his word, his truth, and his hasid, his loving kindness change your life? You have length of days. Let me say it this way. Jesus not one time ever got to the end of the day and called all the disciples together and said, man, guys, I just feel like we totally failed today. We just did not get done what the Father wanted to get done today. We totally messed it up today. Man, I, we only healed like 4,000 people. We only raised 12 people from the dead. We only ran leprosy out. Of, you know, I mean, just, we just were not very good today. It's like the day was super short. It's only like I had 12 hours. Everybody else had 24. We, you know, we even make jokes about that. I don't even feel like I get 24 hours in a day. Jesus not one time ever had a day. Who in the history of mankind had more people demanding things out of him than Jesus Christ? I mean, they couldn't even go on vacation. One time they went to Capernaum to go on vacation, and the crowd showed up. Hey, excuse me, is the healer in here? Because there's like a thousand people out here that really need him. All right, vacation's over, boys. <laughs> Amen. We, Lord, we just got here. I mean, I just got the cap off my Coke. All right, put her down. We got folks to heal. Amen. They followed us on vacation. Nobody has ever had more demands placed on him than Jesus Christ. In a three and a half year ministry, he literally changed the world. 
and we're still talking about him 2,000 years later. He changed the world so much that every single nation, every single um, people group on this earth recognize him as a historic, as a legitimate historical figure and the things that he did verbatim in three and a half years of ministry. He was a very, very busy person. And we think it's cool for us to walk around. Hey, how you doing today? Oh, I'm busy. Super busy. Hey, how are you today? Oh, my schedule. I'm just so busy. I just can't feel like I can keep up. Well, what's going on in your life? Too? Oh, I'm so busy. You know, we think we're cool. <laughs> Let me tell you this. That's hypocrisy. That's a lie. You're not busy. <laughs> if you're busy... You're not doing what you're called to do. Jesus wasn't busy. Jesus was purposeful, but Jesus was at rest. If you're busy, you are not operating your life the way Jesus operated his life. Are you accomplishing things? Of course. I'll tell you this, a person filled with the Spirit of God at rest is accomplishing a billion times more than a person who's super, super busy doing it on their own strength. If you're busy, you probably don't have the opportunity for the Spirit of God to entwine super into your natural, and you are not going to accomplish what you're called to accomplish because you're doing it from your own strength. <laughs> so guess what you're never going to hear from Pastor Steve? How are you doing today? I'm busy. You're never going to hear that. You're going to hear, I'm blessed. You're going to hear, I'm standing in faith. You're going to hear, I'm greatly loved. But you're never going to hear, I'm busy, because I'm not busy. And it, this is the reality. Don't ever call me or text me or email me and say, I would really like to talk to you, but I know you're really busy. I'm here for you. It's my job. It's my life. It's my destiny. It's my purpose. It's who I was created to be. I'm here for you. I will move other things around to meet with you. I love you. I like meeting with you. I like talking to you about the kingdom. I like to see the kingdom get into your life and your heart and change everything in your life. I am not too busy for you. I exist for you. It would be silly for me to be too busy for what I exist to be a part of. Amen? So I'm not too busy for you. Jesus is not too busy for you. The Father is not too busy for you. You know, somehow the Father can run the whole universe, seated on a throne, and still count the hairs on your head, or lack thereof. Amen? How do you like that? That's what happens when the supernatural power of God. So length of days... And long life. Length of days means that you get 26 hours in a day. Everybody else gets 24. Isn't that awesome? It's like a bonus. Welcome to the kingdom. Here's two extra hours on your day. Amen? Also, long life. How long? Here's what I'll tell you. And I don't have time to break this down get the CD from last night. Moses said in Psalms chapter 90 that the, the days of man shall be 70 years and if by strength 80. The person that wrote that, Moses, lived to be 120. If you're keeping up, something's amiss. So he wrote that to the rebellious children of Israel who walked around in circles that took an eight-day journey and turned it into a 40-year camp out. And they all died. How, how early did they die? 70 or 80 years old. So part of the curse is for people to not live past 70 or 80 years. Here's what I'll tell you. If you live to be 80, you're doing all right. If you live to be 60, you had your life stolen. Now, I know a bunch of folks are going to get super, super mad because you're going to say, you know, great Aunt Susie really, really loved God, and she died at 53 from, you know, breast cancer or whatever. I'm not here to criticize and to judge and to condemn or whatever Aunt Susie. Here's what I'm telling you. The Word of God, the Word of God says, man's days, mankind's days shall be 70 if by strength 80. That's how long they'll live. If you are under 70 and you die, there's either three, there's one of three options. One, the enemy stole your life. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he's pretty good at it. And I'll tell you, he is pretty good at it. He gets away with it a lot in people's lives. Number one, the devil stole it. Number two, <laughs> you're going to super love this one. Um, number two, you didn't know. You were oblivious of the promises. It says that they died in unbelief. In Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4, it says that the same good news was available to those that died in unbelief in the desert, walking around, 
the same gospel was available to them that was available to us, but they did not have it because they did not mix it with unbelief. So that's the second thing that can happen to you. And the third thing that can happen to you, and I believe that this is a godly thing, you can be martyred. So if you want to die young, here's the only thing that I'm going to put my stamp of approval on is your pastor, martyrdom. I'd encourage you to do it too, by the way. I mean, it's a good way to go. If you want to go out in a blaze of glory, go out somebody killing you for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ in some nation where they hate it. Because look at the way Stephen died. Man, that was awesome. Man, I see Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father, standing at the right hand of the Father. Oh, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Man, you want to go on into the afterlife, talk about a good way to go, letting a bunch of people try to kill you. They can't kill you because you're so busy focused on Jesus and seeing his glory that you can't even die. You have to leave your body before it'll die. Those rocks didn't kill him. Stephen left, and his body just fell over. Amen. So anyway, the point is, the person that wrote Psalms chapter 90 that gives us this instruction by God lived to be 120. So here's what I'll tell you. <laughs> and I'm just going to drop this and move on because we've got some better things to do. But if the person that wrote the psalm that says man's days are 70, if by strength 80, lived to be 120, and I'll remind you about how he died, his natural forces were not abated, and because we're PG, I'm not going to get into that, and his eyesight was not dim. So at 120, he had perfect vision and perfect physical ability for stuff. At 120. At 120. And he lived in a worse covenant, under worse blood, under an unfinished work of the cross. I, I hope that this is super stirring you right now. You need to stop biting into the world's belief system that, you know, 50 is old. 40 is over the hill. 50's down the hill. 60, you're just hanging on for dear life. If you make it to be 80, you are a goddess. That is a lie. I believe that if you don't make it to 121, that you didn't even have what the least of all the saints was. Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets, and the he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. So if the least person in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist, and great John the Baptist is greater than Moses... That means that just to even start off a Christian life, 120 is just the beginning. You know how wise you're going to be at 120 if you keep listening to me? <laughs> Amen. Now, on top of that, you put that down three, four generations, because you live to be 120, 130, 140, you're going to have great, 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 great grandkids that are going to learn from your wisdom. You know why future uh, past generations, especially in the Old Testament, you know why they were so godly, they had so much power, they had so much miraculous occurrence? Is because, let me say it this way, Abraham was, um, Noah and Abraham were living on the earth at the same time. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. You think that this is a great big span, but they lived to be 900 years old in the Old Testament. Think about that. If you have 140 years worth of wisdom and worth of the Word of God in your heart, you pass that on to your great, great, great grandkids, you realize how high they're going to stand because each generation is supposed to stand on the shoulders of the generation before, the generation before. You know what we could be raising up if we believe God for 120, 130 years worth of godly wisdom to pass down into future generations? You need to believe God for that. You need to stand strong in the New Testament. Long life and length of days shall they add to you and peace. You don't just get to get old and get cranky. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> but... but if you're getting older and you're getting crankier, then you're not getting old in God. You're getting old in the world because the world makes you cranky. God makes you full of joy, full of peace. Then long life and peace shall they add to you. Verse 4, so shall you find favor and good understanding. The word good understanding in the Hebrew is good success. You know there's a difference between good success and bad success? Amen. I've had bad success. It stinks. But the world totally loves it. Oh, way to go. Did you see who was on the cover of Playboy? Woohoo, good for her. What? Good. What? Good for her. Way to go. What? This is the world's standard of success. 
Did you see who was in such and such a movie? Do you see who had to give away all of their morals, all of their characters, had to literally become a slave to the Hollywood system, but they, got, they made a million dollars? Congratulations, you're just a high-paid um, person for sale. <laughs> I'm doing better, I promise you. You know, there, there are things that the world be willing to pay for you to get your character and your nature out of you. And that's called bad success. There's good success, which means that you can have prosperity, you can have health, you can have joy, you can have peace, and you can have all these things together at the same time. You don't have to trade one for the other. Well, I'm rich, but I have no joy, I have no peace, I have no marriage left, you know, because I had to get divorced. I, have, I was just talking to Scott the other day, and he was telling me about some of the fellows that he used to work with that worked overtime, 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 seven days a week, overtime, seven days a week. He said they're all divorced, but they had a boat. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but they had a boat. They had all this overtime, they had all this money, so they had a boat, but they had no marriage. Kids didn't like them, they weren't around. Do you really want to trade that for that? You know, God actually wants to make you wealthy and have a good marriage and have family that loves you and have all these amazing things in your life. There's good success and there's bad success. God is shooting for good success. What do you want to shoot for? So shall you find favor. You know, you don't find things you're not looking for. Are you find, trying to find favor with the world or are you trying to find favor with God? If you're trying to find favor with the world, you'll find it. The world would love to put you on a pedestal and woo woo your name all over the place. God would love for you to put him on a pestle and then he'll whoop, whoop your name all over the place. Amen? God wants to exalt you in due time, but you have to humble yourself under his mighty hand first. So shalt thou find favor and good success, good understanding, good success in the sight of God and man. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. What does all mean in the Hebrew? With all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. You know, some of you have gotten really good at doing things your way. <laughs> Amen. And by some of you, I mean me too. Some of us have gotten really good at doing things our way because our way is the best way, right? This specifically says you don't lean on your way. You lean on his way. His way is a better way. What's his way? Given it shall be given unto you. Yeah, but Lord, I need that. <laughs> you think you need that. What you need is me. Amen. When you put him in instead of that stuff, you will find that your stuff gets to grow exponentially while he becomes intimate with your heart. Trust in the Lord and lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways, what does all mean in Hebrew? In all thy ways, acknowledge him. This is really cool. The word acknowledge is the word yada. Yada. You know, like yada, yada, yada. It's yada. If you want to know what yada really means, look in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says, And Eve knew her husband Adam, whatever his name was, I forgot it for a second. And Eve knew her husband Adam, and she brought forth a child and named him Cain. You know what the word knew was there? And Adam, I'm sorry, Adam knew his wife. Eve didn't know Adam. Adam knew Eve. This is totally the way it works in a marriage, by the way. Adam knew Eve. <laughs> You'll catch that on Tuesday. Adam yada Eve. Adam yada Eve. Now you think that's creepy, but I want you to see the context here. Adam intimately had an experience with Eve, and it brought forth a child. It brought forth fruit. You know why children are called the fruit of your loins? Because God set it up that way. They're fruit. You know how you have fruit? You have intimacy, and a seed comes together in a womb, and then it brings forth fruit. It only comes from intimacy. There's no other way to do it. I don't care what science has to say. That's the only way to do it. It has to come through intimacy. Only through intimacy is fruit brought forth. Now, do you want to bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life? It comes from intimacy. Only through intimacy does fruit come. Yada. Adam, yada, Eve. And so back to uh, Proverbs, in verse 6, In all thy ways, yada, him. In all thy ways, have intimate, have intercourse from the Spirit, from a place of intimacy with him. You know why? 
Because he knows what you need. He knows how to do it better than you know how to do it. He knows how to make it work when you don't know how to make it work. He knows how to bring peace into your stress. He knows how to bring health into your sickness. He knows how to bring prosperity into your poverty. In all your ways, have intimacy with him, and he can bring these things forth. And then he'll direct your paths. You know, God has a path. It's like the world is a landmine. Or the world is a minefield. That's the word I'm looking for. The world is a minefield, and God wants to say, step there, don't step there. But I really want to step there. Okay, trust me. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways, yada me, and I will direct your path. Step there, two steps forward, one step left, three steps forward, now jump, jump! But God, jump, trust me. But God, jump. Okay. Oh, hey, I didn't blow up. Yeah, because I'm directing your paths in all your ways. Yada him, and then he'll have a way to guide you through this world's minefield. Amen. That's a good truth. That's good preaching. That's, that's, I'm happy about that. No, 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 that's poverty clap. You keep that. That was just good preaching. I just got blessed by that because I need to sidestep some landmines. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Not, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Depart. Take that part off. Depart that. Evil is not something that you should have in your life or your heart in any way. Depart that. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Now let me tell you what it does not say. If you're doing these things in your life, it does not say it shall be like health. It says it is health. You know what your navel is in the Hebrew? This actually is the word umbilical cord. What is the umbilical cord? The umbilical cord is everything to the baby. Everything. Everything comes through the umbilical cord. Everything, all the nutrients, all the energy, all the life, all the calories, all the oxygen, everything comes through the umbilical cord. God's word and God's ways in your life is the umbilical cord that is filled with, this word health is medicine. In the Hebrew, it's the word medicine. It will be medicine into your umbilical cord. Not like medicine, it will be medicine. You probably cannot quote to me five verses for your health and tell me where they're found. You probably can't. If you can, God bless you. But you probably can't. But you can tell me exact, you could draw me a map and give me a word picture to tell me exactly where the aspirin is in your house. You could map me directly to the aspirin. You could show me where the I don't know medicine, so I only know a few, so I'm just going to say it. You can tell me, show me exactly where the tube of preparation H is. You can show me exactly where the, the cream for the whatever. You can show me, for real, you can give me five medicines that are in your house and direct me. I could be talking to you on the cell phone. You could say, take three steps, go to the left, go into the medicine cabinet, on the right-hand door of the medicine cabinet, third door, third little shelf up, two little bottles in from the left, that's the aspirin. Where does it say, and God sent his word and it healed them and delivered them from all their destructions? Well, I don't know. It's in there somewhere. What if I went to your house and said, can I get some aspirin? Yeah, it's in here somewhere. You, you, you want me to find it? <laughs> yeah, it's in, it's in the house somewhere. I, I know we got aspirin here somewhere. So you basically want me to tear up out the house looking for the aspirin. Yeah, it's fine. You know what? I'm going to have a headache for a long time. For real. Listen, beloved, if you really are believing God for something like health, you'll be believing God and not mentally assenting to that. If you're believing God for prosperity, you'll have five verses. You'll know exactly where they're found. I'll come to you and say, what do you believe in God for? I'm believing God for wealth. Why? Because Deuteronomy 8.18 says that he gives me wealth so that he might establish his covenant on the earth. Really? That's what you're believing for? Yeah, not just wealth. 
It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, that he became poor so that him, so that we through his poverty might be made rich. I'm not just believing for wealth, I'm believing for rich wealth. Whoa. And then it says in, in Proverbs uh, 28, it says that he, add, he gives prosperity, he gives wealth, and adds no sorrow to it. So not only am I going to be wealthy, but I'm not going to have sorrow that goes along with that wealth. Whoa. Well, what about all the needs that you have in life? Needs, needs, needs. I got Philippians 4.19 because by, uh, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Wow, really? Oh yeah, he wants me to have this. How do you know he wants me to have it? Because it says in 3 John 2, Beloved, I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health even as thy soul prospers. Man, you're really believing God for this stuff, ain't you? You betcha. You betcha. I know exactly where to go in the medicine cabinet to find it. Do you? Well, I, I just can't remember the Bible that way. You know what? You can remember your kid's birthday. Well, that was a big day. Huh, you know, you might need some health. It might be a big day for you. Some of you can remember, some of you can tell me who won the World Series last year. You can tell me who pitched the last game of the World Series and won it last year. You might even tell me how many strikeouts and how many, how many balls he had and how many, you can tell me his ERA. And you can't tell me Philippians 4.19? I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I'm trying to get you to believe. Some of the things that we think we believe, we don't believe. If we really believed them, we would go and we would find the truth and we would apply the truth to our lives. It's medicine to our navel. It's medicine to our umbilical cord. And it's marrow to our bones. You know what marrow is? Marrow is talking about freshness. It's talking about, um, it's, it's talking about the, the, um, the moistness that's in our bones. If you, if you know what marrow does, marrow is where your red blood cells are made. Do you know how important your red blood cells are? Well, let me tell you this. What color is your blood? That's how important your red blood cells are. And this is saying that the Word of God, the principles of God, going into your life, into your heart, you leaning on them instead of leaning on your own ways, you leaning on them instead of leaning on how you feel. You going it that literally is producing red blood cells. Red blood cells, Deb just taught me this. Red blood cells take oxygen to your all your body. It takes health to all your bodies. They carry everything to all of your body. If you want to carry all of the good things that your body needs into all your body, then let the word of God, let the power of God, let the truth of God, let the experience of God and the intimacy of God get into you the way that you need it to get into your you know, I can tell you some super, super intimate things about Kay. Super, super intimate things. And I'm not going to have to hunt them down. I don't have like some book somewhere in my office where I can go refer to intimacy, you know, A. Uh, I, I don't, anyway, I don't have that book. It's in my heart. If you can tell me it says somewhere in there by his stripes I'm healed, you don't believe it. It's not somewhere. It's not somewhere. And listen, we don't have an honor for God's word. If you honored God's word, you would magnify it even above your experiences with God. And if you magnified his word above your experiences, you would have the promises of his word manifesting and being fruitful in your lives. But we've come to a place in Christianity where the word of God is only secondary to what we're trying to do. Because we're trying to do the missions and visions, we're trying to have experiences, and we want to have really, really awesome worship, we want to have all this intimacy, we want to have all these things, and we forget that in his word is where intimacy is. Don't tell me that you love Jesus and you don't love his word. Jesus is the word. They don't coincide. You cannot tell me you love Jesus and you can't tell me the verse that you're standing on for prosperity. You can't tell me the verse you're standing on for health. You can't tell me the verse that you're standing on for peace. You can't tell... If you really love Jesus and you really wanted to have him intimately as part of your life, you would know him and you would know what he says. Beloved, I'm not trying to cause any problems. Well, beloved, I'm trying to cause some problems. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to understand that until we put this... Hey man, I didn't intend to cause problems, but sometimes it just happens. I, would, I just showed up today and then this stuff comes out. I blame it on God. Amen. We need to start putting his word into us in the same way that we believe for God to have intimacy with us. 
I don't have time to go there. It's on the CD. Please get the CD. But in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, in Luke chapter 6, verse 17, in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, in Luke chapter 9, verse 11, all of these verses say that the way that healing got into people's lives was from hearing. Hearing brings healing. Hearing brings healing. Hearing what? Hearing the word on healing. You hear, and then you healed. A lot of people say, hey, look, just get me healed, and then I'll come to church. <laughs> you know, that works for the people out there in the world that don't know anything about God. You can walk out there and through a, a, a word of, a gift of the Spirit or something, you can just put some healing in people's lives, and then they'll show up to church. That's all great and time dandy. Y'all are already here. If you're not experiencing the healing power of God, then you need to be hearing about healing and you need to hear it so much that it goes into your heart so when I walk up to you and say are you sick I'm a little sick what are you standing on standing on God doing something someday God doing something someday what verse is that uh, I don't know it's in there right no just like Dennis ministered in his opening we have so many people that are standing on a prophetic word or how I feel or all of these things that are going on and we forget that God has already given us great and precious promises that have to do with every single thing in our life and for us to actually violate and go against the word of God is to violate and go against God. If God's word doesn't say it, then it doesn't work. God doesn't violate his word. He's magnified his word even above his name. Psalms 107.20 says that he sent his word and it healed them and delivered them from all his destructions. You know who that is? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. God sent Jesus, his word, and delivered you from all your destructions. Isaiah 53.4 says that by his stripes we are healed. Matthew 8.17 says he himself bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases on the cross to fulfill what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4. And 1 Peter 2.24, Peter comes along after the cross and says, by his stripes you were healed. So Isaiah says that you'll be healed. Matthew says that he was doing the healing. And then Peter comes along and says you were healed. So when were you healed? At the cross. That's when you were healed. You may not feel like it, but I got news for you. You weren't at the cross. You weren't feeling anything when you were being healed. You were being healed 2,000 years before you came along. Now you are healed. Operate in that. And if you don't know those promises, then they're probably not going to be operational in your life. For you to tell me that you're standing on God to heal you and not tell me that you're standing on a specific promise that God has for you and for your healing means that you're trying to get the healing without the hearing. You need to have the hearing to have the healing. You need to have the hearing to have the healing. All right, so stand up, please, because I love you. Sorry, that sounded all bossy. I'm not bossy. Please stand up, because I want to proclaim things into your life. I want to pray and proclaim things into your life. So I want you to have the universal sign of I'm ready to receive. This is the universal sign that says that whatever you got, I'll take it. I'll take two hands full. Amen? Because you want two hands full. You don't want to limit what God wants to do. So this is you, and you're in a posture. You're in a position of receiving. So now I'm going to pray, and you're going to receive what I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to proclaim a blessing over you. Father, I thank you that you're beloved right now, that they've gathered together to hear and to be healed. And Exodus 15, 26 says that you are the God that healeth us. You are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. And Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 2 came along and he became our great physician. And so we believe that, the, that the, uh, what the Lord has prescribed for our lives is the medicine of the word of God. Your words are like medicine. It's like health unto our flesh. It's like health unto our marrow. It's like health unto our umbilical cords. It is medicine. And so right now we take these words and we let them go down into the cell structures of who we are. I speak to ears, ears that were closed. I speak to you and I command you to open up. Eyes that were becoming dim. I command you to start seeing properly in Jesus' name. Backs that were hurting. Backs, you need to line up to Jesus' name. You need to line up to the healer who healed you. His back was striped so that our backs could be healed in Jesus' name. 
No legs, no hips, no ankles, no knees have problems, have clicks, have, have weakness in Jesus' name. All of our bowels, all of our internal organs functions perfectly in Jesus' name. I proclaim this blessing over this people. Thank you, Jesus Christ, that you are our healer and you've already done the healing. So we receive that now. We receive that now. We are in the universal position of receiving what you have for us. And so now, Father, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, as your minister of the gospel, as a general practitioner in the word and the power of God, right now I proclaim as pastor, as shepherd over this flock, I proclaim that, beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ, desires above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. And I pray the same thing with you, Lord Jesus. I pray, beloved, I pray that thou mayest prosper and be in good health even as thy soul prospers. So if that belongs to you, I want you to receive it. Close your hands up. And I want you to take that and let it go into the marrow of your bones right now. Into the marrow of your bones. I thank you, Lord, that you're manifesting healings right now. I thank you, word of God, that you're manifesting in people's hearts and lives. Right now, symptoms are dissipating. Lying symptoms of God are dissipating right now. You need to leave pain. I curse you in the name of Jesus Christ. You are not allowed to be in beloved. Pain, go in Jesus' name. Health, spring forth in jesus name in all of these bodies in all of these bodies age i work against you arthritis right now i curse you you have a name and jesus christ is the name above all names arthritis go carpal tunnel i see you you little lion devil get out get out get out in jesus name i run you off like a stray dog jesus name lion oppressive and depressive demons you Touch not the Lord's anointed and do his prophets and his prophetesses no harm in Jesus' name. They have sweet sleep in the nighttime hours, in the darkness of the night, is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to them in intimacy. It's not when fear, it's not when stress, and not when trepidation comes to them. They have sweet sleep. They have visions and dreams of God and his promises come to pass in their life in the night hours in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I proclaim wealth, godly wealth, with which is no sorrow added. Wealth is now proclaimed over these people that they are going to become wealthy in God. Wealthy and prosperous in God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen. Amen. Did anybody have any manifestation right there when we were praying and proclaiming? Was there something that changed? Praise God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise God. Anybody else? Amen. We have never had healing weekend. We haven't had people healed. Praise God. You can hear and be healed. You don't have to wait for somebody to lay hands on you. That's a backup plan. You can just hear the word of God. Amen? Amen. If you need someone to pray for something that's over you, we're welcome to pray with you. You can come up and we'll pray for you. But otherwise, you're free to roam about the country and release good things into people's lives in Jesus' name.